The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Today's story might seem like a crazy one. Repent! Got your attention? <laughs> We've all seen people like this on the street side with a sign or a Bible in hand shouting at anybody that will listen. The story goes on to introduce to us John the Baptist, someone dressed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist eating locusts and wild honey. Wait, that's not John the Baptist. That's a little awkward, don't you think? Sorry, a little fun there. We've all been in those situations where you get that over-the-top zealous person who's trying to convert anyone and everyone. And what do you do in those moments? <laughs> Vert your eyes, hope to not get pulled in, things like that. That's our surface reading of the text, is this looks like a very odd scene. But in reality, it's anything but an odd scene when viewed through the eyes of faith. You see, this is an old, old story that's playing out here today. This isn't a crazy man out in the wilderness shouting at passers-by. Rather, this is the biblical story playing itself out before our very eyes. Those shouts that John are saying aren't just the ramblings of a crazy man, but they're passages of Scripture. Specifically from Isaiah chapter 40, Exodus chapter 23, and Malachi chapter 3. Now, if you're following along, these are some of the most profound parts of Hebrew Scripture, telling the most impressive stories of God and God's people. The story of the Exodus is absolutely foundational for God's people. 
It's how God delivers God's people from bondage to Pharaoh in Egypt through the desert for 40 years along a winding road and into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. Isaiah, a book filled with hope and promise that God will be with God's people and God's people will be with God for all time. These are powerful stories. Even the way that, that John is dressed connects with the story. Quiz time. Who is John connected to by the way he's dressed and by what he's doing here? Anybody know? Oh, this is why we need to go to Bible study, people. <laughs> Elijah, the prophet. One of the great prophets. Locusts and wild honey, that's not disgusting stuff to eat. That's prophet food. So John is here connecting with the people saying all your great stories are not in the past. All your great figures are not in the past. They're here now with you. And what I find amazing is that the people aren't really shocked by this. They have been formed in their faith, and they know that John is reading to them Scripture and demonstrating to them being the prophet Elijah, coming to be with them again. Painstakingly, year after year, these people have been formed in their faith to wait and watch for the work of God in their midst. And now as they see it breaking in, they're coming to see this new thing that God is doing right here in their midst. I imagine you may hear at some point someone very well-meaning say, all I need is me, my Bible, and Jesus. You heard somebody say that before? Yeah? It's a nice thought, but it gets it wrong. It gets it very wrong. You see, faith is a communal thing. Faith is something that's taught and caught and passed down from one generation to the next. That's what's happened in this story today. The people have passed their faith down from one generation to the next, to now when God is moving and acting in their midst, they have the eyes to see and the ears to hear what God is doing. So here's a question for you. Who was it for you? Who was it for you that passed the faith on to you? Do me a favor, look, look down at your pew where you're sitting and, and look, look around our beautiful sanctuary, your vantage point. You're not here by accident today. Even if you thought you were going for a cup of coffee and made a wrong turn and just got too embarrassed and just kept on coming on in. If that's your story, I'm glad you're here, and I totally want to talk to you. <laughs> but you are not here by accident today. You are the result of a long story of one person after the next, investing time, energy, and resources into bringing you here today. So who was that person for you? Or who were those people for you? And I want you to take just a moment today to think about them. Because they sacrificed a lot. 
to bring you here today. There was a point when we were all little kids, right? And I'm sure as much as we think we were absolute delights all the time, we probably weren't. Those of you who have raised children, you know it's not easy to bring them to church when they're little kids, right? I mean, you feel like you lose your sanity and your faith <laughs> bringing them to church because they wiggle and they squirm and they fight and doggone it, kids' shoes makers make shoes that just will not fit on their feet no matter what you do. I think every parent that's brought a small child to church has probably endured the sideways glance they get from somebody when their kid makes a little too much noise, right? And it cuts, doesn't it? It does kind of cut when somebody gives you a sideways look for being in church. Whoever it was that shared faith with you, there were hundreds of things they could have done other than what they did. They could have enjoyed a quiet morning at home on Sunday morning. They didn't have to cart you to youth group or Sunday school or confirmation classes or any other such thing. But they did. And they did that for you. And you are part of a long story of God's people passing down the faith so that people can wait and watch. I didn't plan that. That just works perfectly, don't you think? <laughs> it's like best sermon illustration ever. You are part of a long line, a holy tradition. The people who shared faith with you did so because of the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. Now, our Lutheran catechism says that the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. But I want to throw you a curveball today. You know I like to throw curveballs, right? I'm going to tweak sanctifies to equips. So the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and equips us for this holy work of living out faith. Whoever it was that shared faith with you responded in that way. And even so now today, if you're here in this room or gathered with us online, wherever you are, the Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and equips you for that same work. So who is God inviting you to share faith with? How can you go out from this place today and share the faith of Jesus with? How can you give someone the eyes of faith, the ears of faith, to wait and watch for the holy work of God going on in this world. We don't just keep it to ourselves. We share it with others because it was shared with us. It's a pivotal concept of the Bible for us. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. Someone shares with us, so we share with others. And you've got all the resources you need. You don't need a fancy diploma hanging on the wall. You don't need the latest, you know, leather-bound, gold-foil Bible, any of that kind of stuff. You have what you need right now to share Jesus with a neighbor in need. The Holy Spirit calls, gathers, enlightens, and equips you. So who will you take this to? Amen.